Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. Disturbing Interest is a Horrible Histories, Terrible Mysteries podcast. The past, and sometimes the present, are often a bleak place. Listener discretion is advised. If you're a fan of Disturbing Interests, please like and subscribe. And for the love of God, tell a friend about us. Pretend you're a Mormon. Go door to door with the good news of Disturbing Interests. Preach our gospel, brothers and sisters, and non-gender binary siblings, to the world at large. Because remember... With us, you might be disturbed, but you're not alone. Welcome back to Disturbing Interests, ladies and gentlemen. I am Regina King, your evilest queen, and sitting in her own lovely, lovely house with a lovely cat painting behind her, which you would be able to see if we put this on our YouTube and you choose to go there, is my ever beautiful partner. Hi, I'm Lynn, your docent of darkness. And we're we're on new technology. Woo! We're trying Riverside now. Um, we're switching recording platforms. So this this could be a bumpy, <laughs> this could be a bumpy episode uh, with technical difficulties till we work that out. So we're we're gonna do our best though. Hopefully this is this is good. I love how we are in season six here and we still have technical difficulties. <laughs> Oh, our, our shit is nowhere together. Like, I don't know where that. Yeah, no, I sure not. Yeah. Well, I mean, nope. in our defense, the tech just keeps changing. Like, it, we used to live, yes. you know, like a mile away from each other. And I would just go to your house and we would go blah, 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 blah into like microphones in your house. And then it would go magically in the computer, et cetera, et cetera. And then... Perhaps you guys remember that about four years ago, this little pandemic thing situation happened. And so we were like, shit, what do we do now? So we switched to a different podcasting remote thing. And then that became kind of subscription and pay and you have to do all this stuff. And it was already doing weird glitchy things. We were like, okay, so now we're trying a new flavor of that so hopefully it will uh it'll work i don't know i don't know neither do i however if you all um i'm so sorry too because we were planning on coming back a month ago this is completely my fault i got the covid elrona came in and said, here is your ass, as she handed it to me. So I am still kind of coffee, and my voice is trying to go out on me here and there, and I'm opening us up for our season six. So you know what? It's going to be a fun show, is what I'm saying. It is going to be a good time. I'm just Hang glad in there with you're, us. you're feeling better, you know, and you're, you, you are, as the Finns say, upright and not crying, so that's good. That is my favorite new At the um, moment. answer to how are you doing? Upright and not crying. Upright and not crying. I'm going to start telling people that. I really am. That is brilliant. That is the perfect answer. Um, I have, so we have done many things while we have been gone, listeners, but I have to share this information with you that today I learned something. I learned about a breed called the Spit Dog. Have you ever heard about the Spit Dog? I have. Is this one of the, the medieval dogs that would, like, turn the meat roasting spit situation? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah they like, ran on a wheel like in a the kitchen. Wheel, and but dog. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. But that was placed up and away. They were, like, suspended yep. from the ceiling. And it was so popular that every house in Europe had a spit dog pretty much. So, or at least England. But some of these pictures of spit dogs, my dude, look them up. It is fucking Rocky. It is Sir Rocky himself. I was like, excuse you? You were doing what to my little Busakawa dog? 
I don't know about that. So I had to share that with you. At one point in time, dogs were gainfully employed all over England who looked like my ugly, cute little pupper turning me on spits, just running in place. And now they're extinct. And when I heard that, I was like, I want to see what they look like or looked like. And so there is one stuffed in a museum that looks nothing like the rest of the drawings. So I think he was just like the last spit dog because he was the last dog who worked on a spit. Well, now yes, this is how the SBCA was founded is because the mistreatment of spit dogs in Manhattan. There you go. Well, now you can give him a job. Be like, earn your keep, you little freeloader, and just like have him in there, like making rotisserie chicken every night. You know, just like yeah. There you go. I like that you think he's smart enough to run on a wheel. Well, we we had thought about like with Kesu maybe getting her one of those cat wheels, but she's kind of old now and is not as into it. And Mazakine, I was like, maybe Maz will want. No, Maz likes to like you know, traverse the house at high speeds, causing chaos in her wake. But I don't know that she's necessarily into jogging. Like if you pick this cat up, this is a power lifting kind of cat. This is like a, like a hairy brick. So yeah, I don't think she's a, a long distance runner. No. She is thick with two C's. Yes, yeah. She's a Neko. Meaty, meaty animal. Yes, a mighty, mighty thickness. Yeah, Neko, she will run chaos laps around the house, too. And she wants nothing to do with jogging. And you know what? I can totally respect that. I can totally respect that. I'm a little chaos gremlin at heart. I get, I can get behind that. But you don't want to take anyway, jogging? No. No, jo- no jogging. Can you hear this whirring? Oh, fuck jogging, man. Can you hear this whirring in the background? I do not hear a whirring. No? Mm-mm. Oh, no. yay. That's excellent. That is the cat box. Oh. Uh, my robotic cat box. Oh, yeah, and I was yet. very afraid it was picking up. Yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> this is the sound of shitting. Yes. Yep. I love that my cats have a robot to deal with their, their toilet stuff. That's fantastic. Me too. Me too. We live in the future. This is all we I do. wanted. Yeah. Yeah. This and like teleportation technology, which they have not given me yet. And no. if somebody produced it, I wouldn't trust that shit yet. But you know what? They gave me a cat box that will clean itself. Oh, yeah. I'm I'd be like, you this. get in the Brundle fly machine first. You test that first. Okay. You turn out okay, yeah. then they, maybe we'll think about it. All righty. Well, welcome back after technical difficulties on my end. Again. Again. <laughs> Again. Oh God, I I am the problem. Hi, it's me. <laughs> yes, constantly. No, it's just uh, I'm gonna blame technology. Damn it, technology. That's right. Fuck technology. Um, and here we were just praising her name for giving us robotic cat litter boxes. True. Just yeah, technology good at removing cat poop. Not as good at uh, allowing us to record things. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I'm going to sit down now because I was standing. <laughs> now you're like, ah, oh, come look at me in my fancy, fancy setup. Um, should, should I? Alrighty. Uh, so um, you're going to be doing the uh, the sh- the story today, correct? Correct. Um, I have a. I do have a tiny. Do you want a berry update? A tiny berry update. We all want a berry update. <laughs> For those of you, which speaking of those of you patrons out there who are members of the Church of Berry, I am so sorry that uh, t-shirt sizes, apparently some of them were incorrect. Um, I'm definitely going to get another order out to you soon. Thank you so much for your patience um, uh, with me while I have been dealing with COVID. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you all. Um, But yes, give us all praise, Barry. (laughs) T-shirts are weird, too, on the Internet, because like you're like, oh, you know, there's the just the general fit. And then there's like ladies, which can mean anywhere Mm -hmm. from like a slightly tapered, tapered version of sort of a standard unisex one to fits on a thumb, you know, like, yeah. I don't know, for like the smallest ladies in the world, I guess. 
for like Polly for... Pockets, apparently. Yes. But yeah, so it's for weird. elves. Um, elves, yes. But my Barry update. So, um, so Barry has been at the Winter Palace, which is of course yes. their little timeshare in Myrtle Beach, and um, there are fo- he, so there's a slightly new place that they they moved where they were at, so they're in a different complex down there, and there are hmm. apparently foxes like wild foxes roaming around. And my dad has been trying to befriend them. Oh my God. He's going to have an army of foxes and seagulls. He makes them sandwiches. He makes them sandwiches. I love your dad so much. Yeah, He's trying to, (laughs) trying to be, he's like a demented, uh, geriatric furry snow white just down there. Yeah. Just, it's great. Yeah. He and the neighbors are all, this is like a group project that they're working on. Because he already has a seagull army. Like, the, he and the seagulls, seagulls are real easy to befriend. But the foxes are much more, like, elusive. But he's he's kind of slowly working on it. So this is, like, what he does now during the winter. He golfs and he befriends local wildlife. So, go Barry. But um, he'll be back. I love this. He'll be back at the end of this month, of the end of March. Back to the regular um, digs in uh, on the shores of Lake Erie, and we'll actually be going yes. out to visit him because the uh, big solar eclipse on the eighth of April, uh, northeast his tiny little town that he lives in is his. It's in the path of totality, so we're gonna fly out and um, keep my dad from staring directly at the sun. <laughs> Because he was real excited. He was like, oh, I remember back in like the 70s when I was commuting all over, you know, for work. And I had to like drive down the, the tur- PA Turnpike a bunch. And and they were on the radio and they were like, hey, the eclipse is coming. And you can look at it safely if you poke a hole in a toilet paper roll. And I you know, I got off the highway and there's all these people just at a rest stop waiting, looking at it. I'm just holding up toilet paper tubes, staring at the sun. <laughs> And I was like, uh, I'm going to bring glasses, Dad. Don't, don't, um, that, yeah. So anyway, I'm bringing him glasses so he doesn't go blind. It's going to be great. <laughs> oh, God, I love Barry. All yeah. praise Barry. <laughs> yeah, so it's, somebody has to keep my dad, uh, yeah. So basically, apparently, like, every hotel in the Lake Erie area has been booked out for, like, years because people are so excited about this because there's a pretty wow. narrow band in North America that you'll be able to see this thing. And I guess it's the last one for like decade plus or something like that. So like people who are into eclipses are really into this. So I, yeah, it's good for the local economy, which it could use some good. So thank you, the sun for <laughs> boosting uh, tourism in the, uh, the burned over country, which is where we'll be hanging Hanging out. So, yeah, I'm going to go say hi to Barry, see how he's doing. It's going to be, you know. And he told me a crazy story about my grandfather, not his dad, but but his ex-father-in-law, Big Lynn's dad, D, um, on the phone. He was like, yeah, do you ever try about the time that your, your granddad had to hike into the woods? And I was like, had to what? So, apparently, during, <laughs> so this is a World War II story. World War II, my granddad... Um, he, he apparently he's you know he's a private he gets drafted it's middle of the war he had had a couple of years of college but now he's off on a boat to trinidad and tobago in the caribbean uh because they you know he's going to be in an outpost there that helps to refuel ships that are going over and also keeps an eye on the coast to make sure that like the u-boats and stuff aren't coming over to blow shit up in north america and so he's down there, and they find out he's got a little bit of, of college behind him. And so they're like, you get promoted, uh, because most of the guys didn't. So suddenly he's a rank up, and they're like, hey, we've got these reports from these you know, folks on the island that are living on the island on the other side that's not very populated that they think maybe at night uh, German U-boats are coming up into the bay to release some air because they're hearing these these crazy, like, whooshing sounds in the bay so i'm gonna need you take a bunch of guys and just like march at night through the jungle so nobody can see you and go check this out so my granddad's like okay and my granddad has a degree in forestry so like he's good at forests but like 
the forests of Appalachia. But not the jungle not at night. the jungle night. of Trinidad and Tobago, but there they are, all these dudes out there with machetes, like, confusedly. You know, these are people from, like, the mid-Atlantic. They don't, they don't, this is not, we don't have jungles there, okay? So, <laughs> In their way at night. I really, really uh, like like this uh, this image I have going on in my head of a jaguar, just like seeing the first guy and being like, "Oh, I can take him. He doesn't know what the I fuck don't... he's doing." And then the rest kind of trip in, and he's just like, "These idiots are going to get themselves killed. I'll come back later." I wait. I I think he's safe because I don't think there's anything like like jaguar ocelot like on the islands, but I don't know. So. Anyway, they're hacking their way through, right? Um, and he does end up with malaria at some point later on in this whole situation. But, you know, that's not this particular story, but during his time there in the in the Caribbean. So he's hacking his way through the underbrush. Shit, my dad tonight. had malaria last year. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it's it's kind of a thing. It's, uh, yeah. Hey, if we stick around and global warming gets bad enough, we'll probably get malaria up here in uh, in the Pacific Northwest, you know? So, you know, they're, they're hacking their way through, and they finally, after several days or, or nights, I guess, of like tromping through this jungle, clearing it, etc., they make it to the far side of the island to this kind of uninhabited bay area. And it's night, and they're out there and they're waiting, you know, and they've got their little, their, you know, binoculars and they're checking it out. And then suddenly, they they hear the whoosh, and, and you know, the grandfather and everybody train their binoculars on it, and it's, it's whales. Guys, it's whales. It's like literally like like <laughs> big sea cetaceans, sea mammals out there at night. They apparently come into this very secluded bay to sleep. <laughs> and the whoosh of the U-boat is just whales coming to the surface and blowing air. Whales. It's whales. So <laughs> that yeah, is amazing. Go. Yes. This is so how how my my granddad hacked his way through the underbrush of the jungle on the Caribbean island to discover German U-boat whales. So yes, whales. that was that was whales. my dad's. Yeah, and you know what? Back, if every story with Nazis ended with "it wasn't Nazis," it, wasn't it was Nazis. whales. It was whales. It was whales. First off, we would probably not like whales a whole lot more than we currently <laughs> like, like whales. Like, second oh, off, from those fuckers, get them, get them. Yeah, I but no, it was whales. <laughs> but second off. I would be so confused at so many stories <laughs> that we have. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so no, it was it was whales. So, yeah. Nice. Anyway, nice. that was my my random weird start us with Nazis, but not Nazis. Nazi, not Nazis. Uh, they are not Nazis. Um, Nazis. Yes. 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 Uh, should yes. I, I like should it. I bust into my horrible beverage? Oh, you oh, yes. shall. So, that is a very pretty can, got, at least. So I got classy shit for y'all today. You really did. Have, Look at that. Death and Company, Aurora Highball, Woody Creek Ooh. Vodka, Pear Brandy, and Sake with green tea and mint. Now That sounds delightful. It does, but there's a, there's a non-zero chance this is going to taste like weird, like, hippie soda too so we're gonna find out so i'm gonna bust it. i'm I over here it. envious of your drink well, tonight I, I chose it because it was small and it's only eight percent alcohol by volume because i have not yet had dinner and i went and got the novavax shot today so who knows what's gonna happen to me later um but we'll find out so i'm gonna bust into this seat oh splashed all over my keyboard who knew doing drugs when you were an adult meant that you were going to uh, chase a vaccine with a can drink of wine, mixed drink, and get Something. really flying. Oh, God. This is what let's do shots means when you're my age. Mm -hmm. okay, it's, it smells, it actually smells quite nice. Like this, it doesn't have that like weird, like mm, chemicals aroma. Mm -hmm. It does not, in no way does this smell like you might degrease an engine or clean a floor with it. So I'm already in. Okay. Oh, oh, that's nice. That's nice. <gasps> I want one. This, honest to God, you guys, this, I think this was also kind of like somewhat expensive too. It was worth it. Like this, this is this slaps. This is well. It's called Death and Co. Death and Co. Death, Death and, and Co. Co. Aurora Highball from the Craft Spirits Cooperative. It I'm is have to get that. super fancy. Yeah, it's it's from Ventura, California. So it's Woody My Creek people. Distillers. 
yeah, no, this is um, this is some good at this is some hipster shit, and I am here for it. This is nice. I'm actually starting us off on like a delicious and classy note. I might actually drink this whole thing slowly during the episode instead of I, the usual two sips, and then I put it at the end of the desk and try not to make eye contact. So, cheers! I think guys. you should. Yeah, I think is, you should. This is not to be wasted. This is actually good. This is nice. So, like. Definitely a thumb up for this. So definitely. Wow. Go it's check been it a out. while. <laughs> I will definitely check yeah. it out. A side note, one more thing I forgot to tell you about Spit Dogs. Spit Dogs, okay. They made their way into the United States via the guy who founded Pennsylvania. He is also the one who ordered their little wheels from Europe and directly after. Do you mean William Penn? <laughs> Yes. It was William yes. Penn. He was like, oh, it was William me, Penn. I'm going to bring me some rotisserie chicken hamster wheel dogs. Let's go. Yep. From Europe. From Europe. He brought them nice. on over. Nice. And uh, yeah, yeah, we know that they did pick up some some popularity in the U.S., not as much as Europe. But I, I had to tell you that because oh, I was like, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's do just get kicked off here with me swishing around which screens my stuff's on. Okay. You do not know what we are doing today, I do, do not you? Know. Nope. We've got a big one today, guys. And I'm just going to dive in. Okay. For season seven, I decided to open up with another infamous person out of the annals of history. And we've told you about quite a few infamous people over the last five years. Sure. And whether they were like incredible testaments to the human species or just absolute fucking trash fires that kind of make me want to imp impose breeding license that are conditioned upon, you know, IQ tests and basic human in empathy. Um, no matter what, though, they were infamous. So are we um, talking someone in the first camp, the yes to people, or the second camp, the no to people? We are talking about somebody from the second uh, camp. Yeah, I, I figured. I reckoned. Yeah. In fact, they're a subject of such great evil that, like, she's about, uh, brought about a great amount of suffering oh, to those she person. considered lesser than her yes okay an evil woman margaret thatcher <laughs> it's margaret no. thatcher isn't it okay no. all right no um however nancy reagan is it nancy reagan it could be <laughs> it could be but no this is somebody i can't believe i'm saying this but this is somebody far worse worse than nancy reagan wow I know. I know. what worse than margaret thatcher Okay. All right. Yeah. So this has to be like a later, like a back in history, right? Not a recent. Mm. No, it's a recent. Weird. No, this is back in history. Okay, I am agreeing. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. It is back in history. Um, in fact, we are going to one of my favorite eras. Uh, anyway, we'll get to that. Okay. But before that, I was kind of disgusted for my with myself for a second because I couldn't help but... Like, take a moment and regret the loss of what could have been an incredibly just amazing figure. Like, she could have gone down that other path, and we could be talking about an amazing, infamous person if she wasn't just a total inhumane piece of shit. Um, she chose but, violence? Is that what you're saying? She, yes. Okay. Yes. Chose okay. Yes. A person of so, considerable talents, but picked the bad path. Went to the bad place. Way bad. Okay. Um, in fact, to Ilsa, this day. She's devil of the SS. No. <laughs> no, right no. No. Um, anyway, but like to this day, she you'll still hear her name frequently in New Orleans because of the atrocities that she committed oh, there. Oh, is it uh M Madame LaLaurie? You got it! I hadn't even asked you yet! I was well, gonna I mean, ask you! Okay, well, I mean, you said New Orleans, and I was like, terrible yep. people, terrible ladies from New Orleans. Like, 
and I was like, that that's kind of the 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 main bad person. Oh, and I did promise you the stupidest story from New Orleans. Uh, just today in the newspaper, I read uh, it was some kind of the it was the the um, the headline was beautiful. The rats are all high. So what apparently it was what, amazing. Yeah, the rats are all getting high. Apparently that has been the like the and the the New Orleans PDs um like the the I don't know what the the, the what is that like the police commissioner anyway the person that is like please give us money for a less shitty building person uh, apparently was like <laughs> the rats they're getting into our evidence room and they're eating the marijuana and I was just like oh lord. Like, can, it can open up jars. Okay. They're little tiny hands. Somebody's stealing that. Come on, man. Come on. You know what? They're I, on the I desks. say they're getting high. Good for them. Good Good for, for them. I know. Everybody's got to have a hobby. Good for them. Right? Just legal, legalize <laughs> weed for rats, everyone. You know? That's, that's all we got to do. It's, it's fine. <laughs> so I, guess I would personally rather hang out with extremely stoned rats in New Orleans than, than Madame LaLaurie because. She, she was not a yes. nice lady. Well, I'll tell no. you, like, as a macabre bitch who has a second hand tie to the house of former horrors that she lived in in New Orleans, being remembered for atrocities, it's difficult without meeting like an extreme, extreme threshold. So, you know, keep that in mind, guys. <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, for this episode, my sources were Wikipedia, the Irish Cultural Museum of New Orleans, the Haitian Gender Security Project, Genal.net, the paper Medical Training in the United States Prior to the Civil War, the writings of Harriet Martineau, 64 Parishes, the History Channel, several walking tours, a former acquaintance of mine who lived in the Lollary Mansion, Ooh. and my time living in New Orleans. So, I have quite a few sources on this one. Now, I assume the majority of you dear disturbed listeners know who Delphine was, and to a marginal extent at least, what she did. However... For those of you who've not dipped your toes in that particular latrine, I should offer a trigger warning. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I should probably offer a few trigger warnings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Though I will not be going into extreme gory details, and I, I, I read them and they're not good for this episode. Um it does have discussions of violence, abuse, sexual assault, starvation, enslavement, suicide, torture, New Orleans in the late 1700s and early 1800s, extreme wealth and entitlement, me mispronouncing French names and probably some Spanish names yet again, uh, because, you know, six seasons and I'm nothing if not consistent. Oh, it also has an absolute complete lack of fucking justice so there are your trigger warnings laid out for you so with all those warnings why oh why did i choose to tell you all about delphine today well because you just you were like let's start on a feel bad note let's let's do that let's set the tone actually Kinda, kinda. I mean, I am the darker side of terrible, and, and this is disturbing interest, baby. So I was like, "Let's do what we know." Oh, um, hey, my my story next time is going to be absolute piffle, ridiculous, stupid piffle. So it's the balance, well, yes, it is. It is, and this is how we do it. Also, you know, I was recently asked to officiate my dearest friend's wedding down in New Orleans in October and so I was thinking about him a lot and we used to walk by this place all the time and it is so this one's for you Johnny it, this one's for you Marie Delphine McCarthy or McCarthy before it was changed 
was born one of five to Irish immigrant Louise Bartholomew de McCartney. McDay McCarty, who was previously known as Chevalier de McCarthy, and Marie Jean Le Abril. Erable? Yeah, this is going to continue. Yeah, <laughs> something to look forward to. The melting pot of New Orleans in this time period when it was changing hands between the French, the Spanish, and the Americans, is one of the most confusing knots of names, changing nonsense I have ever seen. And and me being the little research hound that I am, I could easily lose a few lifetimes tracing pieces of paper in old libraries, conservatories around the world, just to find out more about those long since passed in these tales of horrors because they switched their names so often back then. How could people be kept straight? It was very difficult. So unfortunately, however, uh, unless there's like a vampire out there with very odd taste, I I think I'm just going to have to be satisfied with the research that I get for this cast. (laughs) Anyhow, her mother, Marie, had previously been married once before and was known as the widow LeCompte. However, I could not find any additional information about her mother's first marriage or her father or anything or even much about her siblings. It's pure speculation, but I'm going to add a reminder that this is the era when very young women married very old men and often powerful men, a practice that made it very possible for women to marry two or three times, sometimes more, <laughs> before Look their at death. Nicole Smith. I mean, we still do that. Yeah, this is yeah. true. This is true. But usually this was like their families giving them away or something. Right. And, and then they would die in like some horrible old timey way, like childbirth or consumption. I'm not certain if her grandfather changed his family surname upon immigration due to prejudiced attitudes towards the Irish in the U.S. But the prejudice was there. And anyone who has been with us long enough to have listened to our episode on the Axeman of New Orleans knows that it persisted into the early 1900s. Um, It began in the 1700s, apparently, when the city saw a large influx of Irish immigrants who were fleeing the religious persecution they faced at the hands of the English. It was cheap passage from Liverpool to New Orleans, where many Irish immigrants found fast and dangerous work on the New Basin Canal, and it claimed many lives. That was not Delphine's family story, though. No. And by the way, I will be calling her Delphine throughout this entire thing, because for most of it, she was younger than I am. But no, money makes all the difference in everyone's journey. And Delphine came from a very powerful family in the South. First, though, it's important to understand the setting of the story. When Delphine was born, it was in a Spanish territory, and when she fled justice, it was from America. Now, New Orleans is still a vibrant port town to this day, shining and beautiful, yet covered in the type of filth that threatens to stain the soul. She is beautiful in her melancholy and grime, and I will love her in the same way I would love a lion, wholeheartedly and with great trepidation, for the rest of my life. However, in a time before planes, trains, or even safe sea routes, control over one of the biggest ports in this country or the land at that time, it was being fought over constantly by large superpowers. If New Orleans is a melting pot now, then this is the period in time when all the cheese was just getting soft and beginning to stick together. It was still pretty distinct cultures, but just beginning to become something unique. With French, Spanish, Native American, the African enslaved, or freshly freshly freed men, 
British and rather new Americans all blending together. It was a different world. And for those of you who have not been to New Orleans, it still is. Going down to Louisiana, going down to Louisiana is, to this day, I feel like I should bring my passport to be able to get into the state. It's different. Another thing we need to take into consideration, an absolute fucking fact that our country still likes to gloss over or revise But this is a country that was built on the back of the enslaved. And New Orleans had a large populace of enslaved people. This was a time when the slave auctions were still being held regularly in the square. And people kept were kept shackled in worse conditions than livestock in a place that now houses one of my favorite French restaurants. And I can tell you guys, whether you're believers in the woo or not, I've stood in the area where they were kept. There are shackle bolts that are still in place in the bricks. It's in its original condition and like it's exposed to the elements because it's in a breezeway. But even in the height of unconditioned summer, when I stood in this area, it was absolutely ice fucking cold in that space it's it's different in 1791 when delphine was four years old the haitian revolution erupted directly impacting her uncle the haitian revolution was very interesting in itself and i highly encourage any of you who are not familiar with it to do some additional research however if you're sitting here thinking regina I barely have time to listen to your disturbing ass. I I totally get you. I feel it. I I get it. So I can give you the highlights, or at least a few highlights. The revolution in Haiti lasted roughly 13 years. (laughs) You know, it's real small, tiny bit of time, 13 years. And it's the only slave uprising that has led to a free state ran by non-white, formerly enslaved people. So it was monumental. The Haitian Revolution was also the largest slave uprising since the unsuccessful revolt led against the Romans by Spartacus about 1900 years prior. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. Yes, that's Spartacus. For those of you out there who believe the revisionist narrative of the history of slavery, I would like to lay down some extremely bare truths that were the groundwork for this revolution. But the Civil War was about states' rights. You know, the states' rights to own other human beings. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. I, um, for those of you who can't see my face or if we don't put this out on video, just know there is a wash of disgust right now. By 1787, the French and English were importing 58,000 slaves to the Caribbean countries, to the Caribbean islands a year. The death rate from yellow fever, starvation, and assault was at 50% within the first year that they arrived. In fact, death was such a prevalent aspect of the day-to-day reality of enslaved life that the practice of polygyny was enforced on women. I might be the in the minority here, but I had no idea what polygyny was. At first I thought, oh, like polyamory. Okay, I guess it makes sense if like that's your, cult, your culture, it, it would adapt to a more widespread practice of like, no, just no. <laughs> no, that's not what it is. If you're on that same thought train that I was, pump the fucking breaks hard and fast just hang out there as i disavow you of that sentiment 
<laughs> that I was so incorrect with. This is far more sinister. We, I think at this point, we all know that I have no problem problem like with polyamory or anything like that i stand behind the beliefs that as long as you know there are consenting adults and everyone involved is like an adult legally and mentally and you're not hurting anyone or anything you do you boo you know you let your freak flag fly you do you whatever makes you happiest it is none of my business what happens in your pants and I don't want it to be. I don't want it to be. <laughs> I need to underscore that because some of y'all send me some interesting DMs sometimes. Anyway, so that being said, polygyny does not fall into my very wide breadth of acceptable practices. You see, it is the practice of enforcing multiple partners onto a woman, whether her consent or desires have anything to do with it, she can be damned as far as they are concerned. That's right. (laughs) The birth rate was so low and the mortality rates were so high, especially for infants, that the slave masters did not allow monogamous relationships for their female captives of breeding condition. Like, if you were old, that was fine. If you were old, you were probably dead at that point. If you were too young, you know, what's too young by them? But if you were of breeding condition and age, guess what? You were treated no better than a prize pig. Seriously, if you all ever want to marvel over strength of character, study the stories of Black women who were part of the Haitian Revolution. I've rarely been so odd. They were so strong and they rebelled in everything that they possibly could to maintain just some semblance of self when they had atrocities forced upon them by entitled Europeans who deemed it was their fucking right. Why was the revolution in Haiti so very important to our story, you might ask? Well, it completely changed the dynamic for how slavery was viewed really all over the world in Europe and the Americas specifically. It was the first step towards writing a global injustice. I could go more in depth about how uprisings in the Caribbean led to dissent here in the U.S., but instead, I'm going to stick to the brief history and relevance to this tale, because if I dive into this most important and often overlooked history any deeper, well, we will have a season one length episode instead of a season six length. (laughs) And we don't want that. We have learned a lot in these five years prior, and we're going to keep on. So the slave masters in the Louisiana areas were scared of their captives. And they did what weak men who oppress through tyranny often do when they feel their power threatened. They exercised intense, widespread cruelty. Though the government had issued statements demanding better care to be given to the enslaved in 1791 after the attempted uprising known as the Mina Conspiracy, considering this backdrop, as well as the fact that Delphine's own uncle had been killed by his slaves in the uprising of 1771, The atmosphere in which she grew up was not like any of our modern minds could truly ever grasp. This is not an excuse. In fact, it's far from it. She was primed to take a seat of power even as a woman, considering her family's affluence in high society. They were were the New Orleans elite. Her uncle was a governor of the Spanish-American provinces, and her cousin grew up and became New Orleans mayor. Hell, 
Even her first husband was a high-ranking royal officer in the Spanish military and held the position of power. And Delphine, well, she could have seen slavery for the abomination that it was. Being raised like royalty herself in a time and place where people were property, she could have used her power and privilege to fight it. Poised in a truly unique position few women of her era ever had, And she could have become a champion of the enslaved. Unfortunately, though, that's not the path that she chose to walk. Instead of becoming the hero of the people, she took a hard, long look at the horrors of humanity and leaned in, becoming an absolute monster. What we know of her early years is all very stereotypical of her time and social standing, at least. In June of 1800, she married her first husband at an obscenely young age, (laughs) through our modern lens, at least. She was 13. You little young. Yeah. 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 Well, unless you're in a cult, that is. I mean, hey, it's still legal in a bunch of states here, still in America, so yuck, but yeah. Yeah, slavery was legal at one time, too. It doesn't make it right. Sure nope, doesn't sure make doesn't. it right. Uh, yeah. I, nope. No. Nope. Nope. Uh, can somebody, you know, your you, the lawmakers out there, you want to protect children so bad, how about stopping adults from marrying them? Let's start there. Let's start the fuck there. Anyway, her first husband, Don Ramon de Lopez y Angulio, was a caballero de uh, la Real de Carlos at one of my favorite churches, the St. Louis Cathedral in New Orleans. He was a 35-year-old widower. Just, Just all of you take a tick there and think about that. 35, 13, 35, fucking child. Ugh. Yeah. Anyway, he was a 35-year-old no. widow, widower. Yeah, not good. Uh, yeah, no, we don't it's like not, that. It, it just makes you feel kind of squeaky, doesn't it? Let, let's let's just, hey, Humbert, Humbert, slow your roll. That's gross. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, that's gross. That real gross. Um, yeah, so he was a 35-year-old widower at the time and had only known her for six months before they were re- wed. <laughs> I did do a deeper dive into, like, this whole royal order of knights, too. And I ended up uncovering 60 others who did all appear to have, like, a familial connection to Spanish nobility. So this even includes Juan Carlos, the first king of Spain himself in 1938, which leads me to believe that Don Ramon might have also held a Spanish title, but I can't confirm that. In fact, I can't even really confirm his age was 35 and not 36. So he was right in there, but we're not positive. When I go back to New Orleans in October, I would love to dive into the old public records there and see what I could find on him or any of these people in this story. But unfortunately, the public records of New Orleans uh, during this time period, most of them have been lost due to natural disasters, fires, flood, all famine, you know, whatever. Maybe the same rats that are currently like eating the (gasps) marijuana and crapping on the desks at the at the New Orleans. Yeah, PD there. That's their their ancestors are there just happily chowing down on all of those records. Yep. Mm-hmm. Reckon. It was the stoned rat's it was fault. The, yep. That yep. It, mm-hmm, explains it all. They got the munchies and, and they it, were like, mm, records, num, num, num. Num, 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 num. <laughs> yes. In addition to being a royal knight, Don Ramon was also the consulate general of the Orleans, the Orleans territory. But in 1804, he was called to appear before a court in Madrid, Spain. <laughs> so why 
did good old Don Ramon have to go to court in Madrid? Well, because at that time, if a colonial officer was going to marry a local woman, he had to receive the king's permission. Okay. However, our good Don Ramon must have decided that that process was way too long for him because he ignored it and using the reasons of and the true meaning behind this phrase really squigs me out but this is what he cited quote unquote conscience and honor as to why the bishop should marry them in defiance of the king or without permission of the king at least I that's pretty squiggy. I'm not comfortable with that. Um, but that's what he said. Conscious and honor. And he convict, like, he convinced the bishop to marry them with that. So anyway, he was called back to Madrid and he took Delphine with him. And on this journey, Delphine was very, very pregnant. I see I'm... the conscience and honor. Eh, gay. I was like, when you said a matter of conscience and honor, I was like, is it because there's a shotgun involved in this wedding? Or, Well, actually, this is completely my fault. Uh, oh, no, I did say it. So she married him in June of 1800. This is 1804 when they're oh, traveling okay. there. Oh, never mind. It, okay. it, yeah, it it took a while for news to travel back sure, then. Sure. So, you know, yeah, especially if somebody was trying to delay it because he didn't ask for the king's permission. Anyway, but um, Delphine was very pregnant on this journey. And unfortunately for them, the sea was quite treacherous. <laughs> and because of, uh, I think a storm is what it was determined. Uh, their ship ended up running aground and crashing off the coast of Havana. And Don Ramon died in the crash. So the very pregnant Delphine ended up giving birth a couple of days after her husband's death in an unfamiliar Havana to her daughter, Marie Borgia Delphine. Fien Lopez y Angulio de la Candelaria. Damn, like, I gotta say, the Spanish freaking win when it comes to, like, rad names. Just, like, you get, like, you get a paragraph. You don't just get a sentence. You get a whole yes. paragraph. Yes, absolutely. But the daughter was better known as uh, Borgita. So, that's fun. She was newly widowed had a brand new baby and she was 17 so Dang. single mother delphine right she ended up returning to new orleans with her daughter and during this time the ter territory of orleans was being passed between the french the spanish and eventually it came to be part of the united states in 1803 when sold by the french you see with war threatening the French and the Spanish and other parts of the world, funding was needed. <laughs> and, you know, what better way to make some quick, easy cash to fight the revolution on the home front than to sell what would become the third of the United States in what we now know as the Louisiana Purchase. Yep. Now, most of you out there will notice that my pronunciation of Louisiana is not so much the standard American pronunciation, much like New Orleans. However, it is the far more typical one to hear the closer you get to the state or when you talk to people from the state. The etymology of the name is derived from the French naming the territory in the honor of their King Louis. When the territory changed hands to the Spanish, they kept the name, but they actually spelled it as Louisiana. So L U I S I A N A, which I believe is the most accurate way to show that the common pronunciation of Louisiana is just, well, wrong. <laughs> 
In 1808, in 1808, four years after her husband's death, Delphine married her second husband. She was 21 years old and had apparently learned the simple capitalist truth that money and power make everything easier. Since she married wealthy financier and legislator, Jean Blanc. Fun fact about husband number two. He was a close friend of pirates Jean and Pierre Lafitte. In fact, they were so close as acquaintances that Blanc delivered Jean Lafitte's famous letter to the governor at the time, Claiborne, where Lafitte volunteered his crew to help defend New Orleans against the British in 1814. Isn't that fun? So basically, we've got legitimate businessmen who were, you know, just legitimate. helping legitimate businessmen just helping out a civic venture there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Also, I like to think of him as a pirate's delivery boy now. Like he he delivers the messages from pirates. Like I I mean I'm always fascinated with the pirate culture because of the whole democracy thing that they had going on. Not to mention who doesn't want to just get out on the open sea and like shish kebabs and people every once in a while. I totally can get behind that. But I mean, what exactly do you have to do to become a pirate's delivery boy? Because I you know I can't really devote all of my time to mayhem on the high seas, but I may be able to vote uh like a weekend here or there running errands like it, did they have task rabbit back then was Look, that I, it i don't know i i know that i gotta take dramamine just to get on a ferry so the high seas are not for me no nope. you do i forgot I do. <laughs> i'm sorry i'm not laughing at your pain no, i don't even enjoy a ferry nope yeah i'm not cut out for pirates uh, i could not join the as much as i would love to join the cast of um, of uh, our flag means death. I I would I would just be, I'd be known as like old Barfy. That would be me. I'd be old Barfy. My flag would just be a picture of a barf bag. That's what it would be. It's better than a picture of barf. All right. <laughs> It'd be like what is that Jackson Pollock doing up there on that flag? Anyhow. So he lived in the French Quarter, and Delphine would go on to have four of his children in the eight years that they were married. The names, though. Oh, sweet baby Jeebus. The lack of originality in their names should have been considered just like giant red flag in itself to her personality, because I blame her for this. Usually women were the ones in charge of naming uh, during this portion of time in this area. But they were named. Marie Louise Pauline, Louise Marie Laure, Marie Louise John, and Jean Pierre Pauline Blanc. <laughs> Maybe you know what? Maybe she's trying to save save money on monograms. You know, <laughs> just mix them up. It's fine. It's fine. You're whoever I say you are. But by the time Jean Blanc died in 1816, he'd set Delphine up to be a very wealthy and affluent widow. And at 29, she was not yet old, really. I mean, she was a widow and she was older, but she wasn't old, older for the times. Don't look at me. Don't come at me. But she was not young enough to be somebody else's responsibility and so she was in no need of a man and we shouldn't be too surprised that she didn't remarry again until 1828 when she married a doctor by the name of Leonard Lewis Nicholas LaLaurie called Lewis by most reports this would be the point in my research where I fell down the pre-Civil War rabbit hole that was physician training in the U.S. and found out two things that I would like to share with you. One, there were only 14 medical schools in the Americas during 1825, 
And it only cost about $100 to get a medical degree, which in today's money is $3,115.32. Sit with that for a second. Medical degree for three grand. Oh, my God. It was we all... would all be fucking doctors. Yeah, everybody was pretty much, hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Nick Riviera. Like, it was a total Dr. Nick Riviera from The Simpsons situation in America. Oh, yeah. No, the whole the history of medical training in the United States is fascinating by which i mean oh sweet lord jesus yeah which we mean it was a shit show <laughs> yeah that was bad yeah. news bears yeah it was yeah it was anyway what was truly scandalous about this marriage was that delphine was had one son with lewis five months before they were wed a and scandalo Escandalo! That needs to be merch. Escandalo needs to be merch. Yes. Escandalo. Based on the ad that Leonard placed in, it placed in the Louisiana Courier upon his arrival to the area from France, it kind of sounds to me like he was a chiropractor with some extra doctor benefits. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And we think that this is how he made Delphine's acquaintance due to several surviving letters between him and his dad and some gossipy bitch. I can't wait to tell you about later because I love me a gossipy bitch, but he was treating her daughter who <laughs> I hate that this is referred to like this, but who was referred to as letter in letters to his father as Mademoiselle Blanc, the hunchback young lady. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was no HIPAA. What, what? Anyhow, there are few reports of cruelty towards her slaves in her life prior to her third marriage. There were a few and more closer to when she actually got married. But does this mean that she never committed atrocities outside of what we know? It sure as fuck doesn't. But you know, perhaps she kept her crueler tendencies in check until she reached her 30s or something. She had a very large predation period. I don't know. All we know for sure is that in her third marriage, we begin to see some extreme abnormalities to her otherwise, otherwise so far banal kind of tale. I can't find details. I cannot find details on how common marrying a younger man was. So I'm not sure if it was truly an aberration. And if any of you do know or could recommend a book on the subject, I would totally love it. Um, you can email me at disturbinginterest at gmail.com. You can email us on the Instagram, um, Twitter, whatever. We are out there. All of the links are in the info on the show notes. But Delphine was 15 years older than her third husband, Louis. And from some gossipy bitches' letters later on, I don't think that was very normal. What was definitely unusual, though, and I generally support for all women of any time to do this, Delphine maintained control of her own finances. Smart. It I, mean, was I hate in, to be like, yeah. good job to someone who was otherwise kind of a giant, ma massive turd, but at least she was a fiscally smart, massive turd. Again, she was in a position where she could have been something truly amazing, but instead she leaned into just being fucking awful. It was in 1831 when Delphine bought the now famous house on Rue Royale that would become known as a house of horrors. In 1832, Delphine and Louis were legally separated for a short time, which also was very odd during the, at those times. For the most typical reason for most divorces that I have ever heard of, and I straight out laughed when I read it because what a fucking cop out. It was, and I quote, due to Lewis having treated her in, a, in such a manner as to render their living together unsupportable. 
Yeah. I I would have appreciated it more if they'd claim like philandering or, you know, her being a sadistic nutbag or something. But yeah, sure. I do love a gossipy bitch, though. Like I said, I love me a gossipy bitch. And enter this gossipy bitch into our tale. The role playing the gossipy bitch will be filled by one Sean Bowes. Yes, there are a lot of Jeans in this story. In a case of Reeves, uh, you... a lot of Jeans, John. Yeah. yeah, yes, this is lots of them. And you know, you may be wondering who this gossipy witch was. Well, uh, uh, he was just some guy, some guy running a plantation who sent gossip-filled letters back to his employer in France regularly. So he could keep him up on the news, which really, they were just gossiping back together. That's what this was, about gossiping back and forth together. Oh, my God. In one of his letters, he is quoted as thus. Madame Blanc has married a young French doctor. They do not have a happy household. They fight. They separate then return to each other, which would make one believe that someday they will abandon each other completely. I mean, accurate, good sir, but el scandalo! Whatever the case, and no matter how messy, the separation was temporary since Louis was with Delphine at the time that the horrors of the La Lurie mansion were brought to light. Now, as much of an oxymoron as it might be, there were laws in place. And I say this with all the disgust that I have in me, there were laws in place to protect slaves. How about, like, you know, just ending slavery, just like not having slavery. Novel fucking idea, right? Well, we're gonna go with slavery light. Let's <sighs> just man, let's I... just dress it up. Let's just put some lipstick on this pig. Let's do that. <sighs> let's make people I feel better hate. about it. It's fine. It's fine. I Remember, hate... we're a country that came up with the whole psychological disorder, and I'm air quotes, drapetomania, which was the crazy lunacy that people who were enslaved might want to, I don't know, run the fuck away because they don't want to be owned. And that's like a mental disorder. So yeah, we're yeah, not. I forgot about that. Yeah, we're not a, we're not good. We're not a good. No. America, not good. No. Not, not, yeah, historically bad. <sighs> Well, I mean, truly, just the human race is filled with yeah. shitty things. Every time I sit down to do one of our shows and or just studying history, I am reminded of that. I'm like, oh, this is why I only hang out with certain people. So, were these laws minimal and rarely enforced? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they were. Yeah. Were crimes against the enslaved rarely reported? Yes, oh, never. Yes, yeah. again. Do I feel squigged out and gross as I can get at that last sentence? Also a big fucking yes. Well, after Delphine moved to the Rue Royale house, complaints began to be filed by her neighbors and merchants about the condition and care of the La Larise slaves. There were enough complaints that the authorities actually made calls on the house several times to inspect the care of her enslaved people. They inspected the slave quarters around the manor itself and even the people. But they made the colossal mistake of not searching the entire property and the top floor where people were being held against their will. I mean, the neighbors witness their will. Like this is yeah. like double, yeah. this is like like horrible enslavement algebra, where we where yeah. we have doubled down. Like we're already holding people just you know in general against their will, but we're really going the extra mile to be absolutely terrible about the conditions to which 
we are or, or that we are inflicting on actual living human beings with thoughts and feelings. Yeah, good times. Good times. Slave squared. Yes. That's what we are saying. Bad. It's bad. Yes. It's bad. So the neighbors witness the Lollary slaves in various degrees of wretchedness. But aside from being underfed, the authorities found little wrong with them and so they left. Because of fucking course they did. At one point, a lawyer was even sent out to remind her of what the laws of proper slave ownership were. So it's clear people knew there was a fucking problem. I mean, there were so many problems, just like the enslavement alone. But in the years between 1830, a year before she moved into the Mansion of Horrors, and 1834... There are 12 recorded deaths of slaves that belong to Delphine. There is no cause listed for these people. And in a time where death was a far closer visitor than now, it's possible that not every one of them was her victim. She's known to have freed two slaves in her lifetime, a whole two. But... The nature of these relationships is lost to us. One of the most famous stories regarding the witness of Delphine's cruelty is about a little slave girl who is fleeing a whip wielded by Delphine and who fell from the upper floor onto the courtyard and died. I've actually stood in that courtyard. I've stood in that spot. And there seemed to have been some creative license taken with this story over time as it was retold, as there always are. But here's what we actually know. She was likely eight years old and not 12, as is often reported. The story that is most commonly told is that Delphine was trying to beat the girl, called Leah in most renditions, for pulling her hair while brushing it and tormented beyond toleration she chose to kill herself by jumping from the window and she was later buried on the property what we know is that this incident did in fact happen and it led to the only semblance of punishment the lollaries would see it was meager but an investigation led to the confiscation of nine enslaved persons Now, those, our gossipy little bitch that he was, provided some of the only written testimonies left available about her behavior with her slaves since the court records are no longer in existence, as I said earlier. He's also quoted in his letters as saying, Finally, justice descended on her home, and after being assured of the truth of the denunciations for barbarous treatment of her slaves contrary to the law the authorities found them still all bloody however even the minor justice was quite frankly a fallacy since the nine were immediately purchased by a relative of delphine's and returned to her it forces me to wonder Is like her whole family complicit to to her abuse? We know that her daughters were aware because there are reports that Delphine would beat them for trying to feed the starving slaves without her knowledge. It seems that Delphine forgot an important part about subjecting people to torture and abuse, though. People will do anything to free themselves of that kind of situation even if that freedom comes through death, which is why chaining her 70-year-old cook to a stove might not have been the smartest choice. On April 10th, 1834, the chained 70-year-old woman decided that death was better than another day as Delphine's property, and she lit the kitchen on fire attempting to burn herself alive. 
I would like to take a tick and really dissect that. It was so bad that burning to death where all of your nerve endings burn off before you get any kind of release. Okay, burning to death was the better option. Neighbors and authorities rushed to the rescue to evacuate all the members of the household. But when the LaLaurie's refused to give them keys to access the entire property, the rescuers decided to ignore the homeowners and just break down the fucking door. Good on them. And for those of you who may not know, there is a history of fire in New Orleans. So people responded fast during that time. One of the first rescuers to enter the room was later deposed about what he found that night. And he was a judge. Judge Jean. Jean. Another Jean. We should play a drinking games. How many Jeans? (sighs) <laughs> so many Johns, so little time. Combien de gens? Anyhow, Judge Jean Francois Canogy, he reported finding, and I quote, a Negress wearing a iron collar, as well as, again, a quote, an old Negro woman who had received a very deep wound on her head, too weak to be able to walk. He also stated in his deposition that he saw several wretched Negroes, their bodies covered with scars and loaded with chains. Of the people the rescuers managed to save, here's another quote about them from Kanoji. Seven slaves, more or less horribly mutilated, suspended by the neck with their limbs stretched and torn from one extremity to the other. And that is the most detail I will go into. The slaves found there were the subject of horrible torture. Horrible torture. Beyond simple imagining. They were flayed, starved, chained, bound in painfully restrictive postures. They even wore collars of spikes that prevented them from moving their heads. And they were in uncomfortable positions. I am not going to subject you fine listeners to those gory details, like I said. But yeah, these people have been know this enough. Yeah, they have. And know this. I, me, the the darker side of our podcast, the, the darker side of terrible. I consider what I read nightmare fuel. Like on the same level as the accounts that I read about death camp survivors from the Holocaust who were exposed to Mengele. Like I had the same amount of by proxy trauma studying this as I did studying some of his stuff. This is bad. According to one of the earliest sources of of the story, when confronted about what was found, Lewis reportedly snapped back, some people had better stay at home rather than come to others' houses to dictate laws and meddle in other people's business. Bitch, what? I'm sorry, what? Bitch, what? (laughs) No. No, no, no. There are not many cases of mob violence where I think to myself, oh, yeah, that was the right move. Uh, But this is one of them. This is definitely one of them. When the story got out and became known to the people of New Orleans, I am impressed that they waited a full fucking day for the authorities to make an arrest before they formed a mob to handle these sadistic fucks because it became clear that the authorities were not moving fast and they were not going to make an arrest of these social elites anytime soon. However, like I said, this is not a story of justice, even mob justice. No. The Lollaries were tipped off to the mob activity and managed to escape the vigilante justice that you know, it would have been okay. It would have seen them adorned adorned with a necklace of rope. And, and I think some people would look lovely in rope. 
they fled in the middle of the night. Um, in fact, one of the enslaved uh, Bonds people that they owned was the coach driver, and he was the one who got them across the poncha train where they stayed in Mandeville before heading over to Mobile, Alabama, and hopping a boat and eventually ending up in Paris. We know that they made their escape to the French port of Le Hever on the ship Poland on June 24th, 1834 from Mobile because one of the fellow passengers was famed American poet William Cullen Bryant. And he noted in his journal, and I quote, Madame LaLaurie of New Orleans is also on board. Bryant also wrote that though she was the one to have, quote unquote, committed such horrible cruelties upon her slaves, she seemed much affected by the reserve with which the other travelers treated her and was frequently seen in tears. Well, that's at least good, right? Does that, that get a little sad? Eh. I, so, from yeah, what I could find, glean, yeah, trying to find yeah, no. the, the, the good in the, the maybe, no, 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 there's no good there. From what I can glean of of Delphine through, you know, my very long scope here, she was never sorry about what she did, never saw it as a big deal, didn't understand why people made such a big deal out of it. And what she was probably crying about was that she had to leave New Orleans. Mm. Yeah, that's that is what I think. The mob in return tore that property apart. A police officer who had been sent to break up the crowd nothing to see here, move along, move along, would later claim that there was little left standing besides the walls of the mansion itself. The property was later dug up, and it was reported that two bodies had been found, and one of them had been that of the eight-year-old little girl, Leah. So, what happened to this absolute shit show of a human after her escape. Well, we do not know much of Delphine after this, but we do know a few things. The first is that even though she lived a luxurious life in a fashionable neighborhood, she pined for her homeland in her excommunication. She longed for her city she thought that eventually the situation would just be forgotten and blow over and she'd be able to return. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's even some evidence that suggests that she didn't even understand the crime that she was in which she was fleeing over. She really didn't see what the big deal was. At one point she even made arrangements to return this was largely due to her son-in-law stealing from her and her having no money, but her children and family members are probably what stopped her from heading back. We also know that Lewis left her after only a few years and went to Havana, and he stayed there. He ended up dying in Havana in 1863. We're not certain how she died. We think we know, but we're not certain. The most common anecdote that we hear about her death comes from George Washington Cable, a famous novelist at the time, and he claimed that she died in a boar hunting accident in France. When in truth, what's most likely is that she died from a long-term unknown illness. She, and I say this not in glee, but feeling like maybe karma, you know, kind of took a little bit back out of her because she died a slow, miserable death in pain. Was it cancer? We don't know. Did she die slow and horribly from letters from her son? It looks like that may be the case. But whatever the case. If you go to St. Louis Cemetery number one, 
there you should be able to find, unless it's been stolen for ritual purposes, which seriously is a problem in that particular cemetery. But there you should be able to find a plaque on a grave on a wall that reads, Madame La Lorie, née Marie Delphine McCarthy, décédée à Paris le 7 décembre 1942, à l'âge de six cut off. However, it's likely a typo since the words in the records in Paris report her death in 1849 at the age of 62, not 1842. I'm wondering if maybe that sixth with the last number that was cut off was nine and whoever wrote that down as what the death date was supposed to say was as dyslexic as I am. So the story of her horrors did not blow over like she thought they would, nor should they ever. In in fact, since then, she has become a known figure, like I said, in New Orleans, on walking tours, ghost tours, in museums, and was even played by the goat herself, Kathy Bates, That's in right. the popular show, American Horror Story. Yep. But what of her victims? Well, according to the records... Delphine owned 30 people when she fled to France. The ones that had been rescued were put on display as proof of the Lollery's horrors while they healed in jail. It's estimated that over 4,000 people came to see them during this time. 11 of these 30 were sold on behalf of Delphine by her lawyer because even though she was fleeing the states from abuse charges against these people, horrors, she was still in control and had ownership of them and still sold them and profited off of their lives. And 19 of those 30? Well... They simply have unrecorded fates. We know she did not free them. She didn't even free her coachman who was so loyal to her that he helped them flee. What concerns me the most is the implications that those 19 missing records might truly indicate. Slave owners back then were meticulous with their records in New Orleans. Like, they were meticulous. You can still find slave records when all other records have been destroyed. For 19 people to just go missing on a pe pe on paper, like, that that's very unusual for the time. That's like saying 19, I'm not even equating people to property. That's fucked up. Nope. 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 That's just it's it's very hard to believe whether they were additional victims of her or not i don't think we'll ever know and i think the best summation of who delphine really was at heart comes from a letter written from her son pollen to her son-in-law who was stealing from her august discussing their her possible return to louisiana he said, she has been thinking about this for a long time. We comfort ourselves with the hope that moments of bad humor alone could make her nourish such a thought. Referring to the sad memories of the catastrophe of 1834. Pollen then conveyed that he who had lived with her and studied with her for years, has seen that ch time ha hasn't changed anything in that indomitable nature, and that, by her character, she is again preparing many sufferings for her children. I bemoan the fate that awaits us if ever again my mother sets foot in that place where her conduct elicited general disapproval. She has caused us to shed 
many tears. And where she goes, we prepare ourselves for bad news owing to her presence. Pollen had reached the conclusion that his mother, and I quote, never had any idea concerning the cause of her departure from New Orleans. And that, my dear friends, is the story of the absolute shit show, Delphine LaLaurie. Well, that was, that was, I, I want to be, that was uplifting. It was not uplifting. That was, yeah, oh. God, yeah. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. So, on that note, we are going to, so our do something uh, section, we are actually deciding to promote a specific charity every few months. So, as we go through the season, you will hear about one specific charity instead of every single day uh, or every single day, like we do this every day. Hey, I'd love to, you know, our Patreon, uh, Patreon is out there. I will send you a shirt that does not fit. Um, anyway, but we decided to um, do this with the do something for several episodes in the row, breaking it up into two or three per season. That way you really get the opportunity to hear more about them and look into them and hopefully decide that is an area of um, interest to you that you would like to support if you can. And for today's Do Something, it actually ties into a previous show that I, or that we did, that I did the research for, and that has to do with the FLDS. Everyone remembers, if you heard it, that absolute scary fuck off cult that I did a story on and I continue to get updates about. Thank you all when you send me updates. I appreciate it. They are still active and still very concerning. If you have not heard the latest updates, I highly recommend you look because, oh shit, like I'm scared that there's going to be a Jonestown kind of end game happening. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, but the charity that we are promoting in today's Do Something is the Short Creek Dream Center. This place is so cool, y'all. It was set up to help ex-members of the FLDS fleeing the religion who want out and want to make a life for themselves. And the coolest thing is it is run by one of the still unfortunate uh, leaders, former wives. And it is set up in his old house. Nice. Nice. She got the house. And she set it up. Yep. So if any of you would like to go out there, donate money, donate time, spread the word, make a purchase on some of their merch, anything that you can do to help support this very small charity that is out there trying to do, make some real headway for ex-FLDS members, um, people who have been trafficked in sex slavery, things like that, please, please, please look into it. Um, their website is shortcreekdreamcenter.org. And if you want to follow up, um, contact them at all. Their email is info at shortcreekdreamcenter.org. Again, that is short Creek Dream Center. Check them out. They're out there doing amazingly good work, and we will continue to talk about them as the season goes on. But on that note, remember, take care of each other, and you might be disturbed, but... but you don't own human beings. I mean, I freaking hope you don't own human beings. Because if you do, that let is them the go moral and stop of today's story. To yeah, don't own human beings. That's no, no, no. Those are human no. beings. Don't own them. And you're not alone. <laughs>